We were born to fight. Welcome back to Label, the stories, rumors, and legends of Tooth and Nail Records. On this week's episode, I sit down with Shane Blay. Shane's from the band Oh Sleeper and also plays in Woven War. He used to be in Between the Buried and Me and a band called Evelyn way back in the day. So Shane and I talk about his personal journey with music, uh, his fight with faith, and of course we talk about him taking over for Tim Lambesis and starting Woven War with the other guys from As I Lay Dying. So sit back and enjoy this conversation with the incredible Shane Blay. Today's show is sponsored by Movement. Get 15% off your watch purchase by visiting mvmt.com slash label. That's mvmt.com slash label. Now, I have to go all the way back, but my first impression of you, I remember seeing you as the dreadlock guitarist for Evelyn in pictures on the internet in 2001 or so. Yeah, way back. Does that sound right? Yeah. Tell me what the scene was like back there, like doing a band in 2000. I mean, when did did Evelyn start? Evelyn started, uh, I was a senior, so 2001. You started that band as a senior in high school and were able to immediately get signed and just do, do that? Like, how's that happen? Yeah, we, right when we graduated, we just kind of started taking off on tours and we would just play like VFW halls and uh, people's houses and shit. just the normal trying to make it as a teenager in a band. <laughs> in that time, you could go on tour just by deciding, I'm going on tour. And you would just yeah. almost drive to places and just, you were just were going to go do it. Was that what yeah. it was like? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I, I honestly don't remember. I don't remember having a booking agent. I think our singer, like Scott, he just called places and we freaking showed up. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't have merch. I mean, we had maybe like one design shirt or some crap. And uh, those are the best days, man. It was like magical. Yeah, it's, it totally is the best days because it's like uh, everything was new. You know, it's the first yeah. time you played in another city or had a big crowd or all that, all that kind of thing. So you're kind of, from, from my point of view, and I guess it was probably partly just the introduction to that style of music and how aggressive it was and how technical, but uh, I think of you as one of the you know high-end virtuoso type musicians, because I was quite a bit older and you were just like really something on well, the guitar thanks, and that guitar work. But what? how did you get so good? Like, Tell me about you being that good at your instrument and guitar and music at, at that age. Well, I appreciate that. I don't know if I agree with it. Um, I I just surrounded myself with really good guitar players. I mean, we had Andy from Embodiment. I know you know them. Yeah, he went to my high school and he was my like idol. And uh, so just learning Embodiment riffs and he showed me Dillinger Escape Plan, which changed my life. He also showed me Meshuggah like in, you know, when we were sophomores or something. So just got into all that stuff first and uh tried to emulate it <laughs> well so that that's what's interesting about it is because when i was trying to learn guitar and stuff like that I was just copying nirvana and green day and weezer so the bar <laughs> the bar wasn't that high even though i thought that stuff was was difficult but you were actually trying to learn dillinger guitar parts and stuff in high school and like as you were developing oh, yeah. and that was your diet of of stuff you were learning by ear and things like that so well in high school we andy uh from embodiment he um at lunch, go to the the Spanish teacher's name was Mr. Killam, and he was like this ridiculous flamenco player. Mm-hmm. And so he would let us kids that brought our guitars to school and whatever. At lunch, we'd just go in his class and just learn. One of the dudes from Travail went to my high school too, Brian. He would meet us in that class. I don't know. We just, uh, everybody got better together. It was awesome. Were you better than the other people around you and you knew and other kids in high school? <laughs> no way, dude. What about, uh, was the scene, was it a Christian scene going on? Was that part of what? what yeah. That some of Because Dillinger wasn't, but Embodiment was. So tell me about that. Yeah, it was. we were all like a little tight-knit sort of cult. And anyone that, you know, wasn't having our beliefs and stuff was definitely going to hell. But yeah, I mean, for like Fort Worth, every show that we ever went to was a place called God's Place. I don't know if Emory ever played there. And another place called Club 412. And uh, those are both run by churches. So the scene was pretty much just those shows there, those two venues. So And you'd have to, you know, they'd have a f- altar call in the middle of every show and mm-hmm. all that. 
And so that that was just what it was used because it was like churches gave you the opportunity to have a place to play and that those kinds of things. So it was just kind of all, it, I always found it that way that it, the scene was tied to Christianity partly because people cared about it, I guess, in the culture, but also more so because it was the positive. It was a big movement in Christianity for it to be a positive place to bring kids and teens and have them play. You know, and it was yeah. safe place and stuff like Drug that. Free. So it all was twisted up. So the more you would involve yourself in the Christian side of it, the more you could have opportunity and be taken care of stuff like that were you christian th- at that time i thought i was uh we were all going to this church at the time called deliverance bible church and i was until one day we had a um i had a buddy that was a like a youth pastor at another church in another city and he came to see to see what deliverance bible church was about and he ended up telling the pastor after the sermon and stuff he's like hey man i think you're kind of taking advantage of these kids and because they were like ki- you know 16 year old kids are bringing all their money and just giving it. And uh, that pastor ended up telling the entire congregation that my youth pastor friend was a messenger of Satan and all this shit. So I, I, that opened my eyes. I was like, I was like, oh, I need to start thinking for myself. I mean, this this could be, I'm just taking for granted what, what this dude is saying and I got to get out of here. And so I just started <laughs> thinking for myself. And around that time is whenever Evelyn broke up, and then I joined Between the Buried Me and the rest is history, but so you grew up Christian then in a Christian household or did you have no, some no, experience? Me, you know, meeting like the embodiment guys and stuff and going starting going to God's place and stuff. That's how I got uh, immersed in all that. Oh, interesting. That's even cooler of a, of a way to think about it. I want to take my time there. Sure. So you didn't grow up in a Christian household. And then because you liked music, you wound up hanging around with Christian people. And then because of that, it was in wrapped up in that scene where you would be at churches and play at churches. And it was fun and positive. And they would do the altar calls and there was pressure on that kind of stuff. So through that process of what they were doing as what they would have considered outreach, at the time you were a successful conversion for them, but it didn't stick. Yeah. Is that right? right. Yeah. So your only time that you participated in Christianity was in the zone of playing music at other people with churches and uh, that kind of thing. Yes. But it was powerful enough to make you believe that you were a Christian. Yeah. I mean, until there was a few times, I mean, like one day uh, they had like this revival thing and um, they poured water on me. I got baptized and they poured water on me and everyone was like touching me and speaking in tongues and shit. And at that point I was like, this is crazy. And I didn't feel whatever, whatever everyone else was feeling at that time. And uh, that was another kind of wake up call for me. I was like, man, just looking around and everyone's speaking gibberish and screaming and I don't know. It, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's interesting. Tell me more about it. So you you were getting you got why did you get baptized? Like what were you uh, what was in your head that was true to you? Like you weren't faking it doesn't sound like you weren't trying to fake it at least. I was trying to just see like from where everyone else is coming from, you know, like in the pressure of getting being there at that revival and like if you've got something to say or something to confess or whatever, like or something to get off your heart, just come up here and we'll take care of it and pray over you, whatever. There's a little bit of like a magical thing there. Yeah. Uh, for like a you know, an angsty young angry teen so you weren't faking though like you weren't saying oh i gotta pretend to be christian so i can play no no music i or anything I, like I legitimately wanted even in no sleeper like years later i would see micah and his impact on people with his lyrics and stuff and just be like i, would, I want to i want to believe that stuff I, I read a whole song about it it's called means to believe And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it wasn't a fake. I just, I couldn't believe it, you know? I yeah. tried. <laughs> no, I hear you. I mean, that 
that's weird to think about because it, whatever your experience is, and you're a successful, prominent musician that went on to have a career and be in front of people and be in Christian bands, that all that stuff. But your experience at the very earliest is one that is, I'm sure, replicated and duplicated tens of thousands of times across the country. You know, like as yeah. far as those experiences and feeling that as a teenager, and there's some pressure, but there's also some curiosity to it, mm-hmm. and and you are genuinely trying to give it a shot because it's so I, I, I don't want to call it manipulative or anything like that um you know they have that pitch and that design and that evangelical call down to something that is effective at least in to get people to try it at least so you decided to be bad like you asked to be baptized it was like i don't, I don't know if y'all have them up there or whatever but uh yeah it was just this big like twice a year they have a gigantic revival at this at this church and you know you stay the weekend and lock the doors and they like play worship music for 16 hours a day or whatever the fuck and um it was just that point where i was like dude maybe if i do this then i'll feel whatever everyone else is feeling and and it was the exact opposite as soon as they poured the water on me i was like oh this is a hack wow. you know <laughs> and then what and do you looking back on it do you think all the other people were feeling something or you think they weren't either and then they were caught up or pretend you know like how do you parse that looking back now i don't want to offend anyone it's just if, if i feel like if you're religious you're kidding yourself either way mm-hmm. um so and you're, it's just an excuse to be ignorant about a lot of things so yeah looking back i'm like yeah all those people were uh insane <laughs> <laughs> that's funny i mean it's funny because it's just i find a really interesting experience because you just have a it, you know the story kind of turns there and so you at the very beginning already knew you weren't going with this and sounds like you've had more thoughts about it since and then yet the, for the next decade you're still in the same kind of stream and having to deal with what you've i mean was that it was a closed case for you at that you're like okay so i'm past religion that's done uh, yeah, that was that definitely built a solid foundation for me, for me to say, yeah, this is over. But uh, you know, touring with Micah and you know, Micah he's a great dude and mm-hmm. uh, he's my best friend and he is just staunch Christian, never turning back. And we'll, I mean, it, you know, some of the best songs we've ever written came out of the, that conversation from the, mm-hmm. the dynamic between me as an atheist and him as a Christian. So. I mean, the conversation still comes up, you know, every fucking week. But uh. since you were seventeen years old until now, it comes up every week. You had to do this. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty fucking over it, Matt. If you're being honest. <laughs> well, I know. I'm hoping maybe this will give you some kind of definitive piece on it, so if, that that you can get it all out yeah. here, and then then other people can you can refer people to this podcast in the future when it comes up. <laughs> So take me from that point of being in Evelyn, being tied up in that scene, realizing that you think Christianity is bullshit or religion is bullshit, and then how did you get to be in a big-time Christian band where all the symbolism and lyrics are Christian and about Christian themes, even the band name is a Christian name and the artwork and it's on a Christian <laughs> label? How did you do that? How did that I'm happen? a hack. I'm a, I'm a fraud. <laughs> No, so right after uh, Evelyn, uh, me and Jason joined Between the Buried Me, which it, that was weird because I got exposed to the straight edge North Carolina scene. Yeah. Um, you, could, you could tell me about that actually while you're here because that band is awesome. You weren't in it for super long, but tell me no. about that experience because I love that band. It was great. Uh, that was that was probably the best I've ever been at guitar it was in that period because, dude, Paul made me just practice my dick off. And uh, it was awesome. I love those guys. It was it was sweet. Ended up being like some differences, like where we wanted to go musically. I wanted to go more like chaotic and they were they wanted to go the progressive, whatever they are now. And uh yeah, we split up, but um, was that and I, that wasn't a Christian band. No, and so what? How did that part feel? Did you enjoy being in a not Christian band at that time? <laughs> I didn't really think about it. They were such different guys, man. They're like they're hilarious and weird, and but yeah, no, like they all hate religion. So right, um, yeah, we just never had it. Never had to come up, you know. And then you said, "I got to go back to Texas and get in a Christian band." No, no, actually, I moved. <laughs> I went and for a 
Beckham girl moved to West Virginia and, uh, you know, Terminal, obviously. Ryan from Terminal gave me a call one day and he was working at GW Equity. He's like, man, fuck this. I'm, I'm surrounded by like 40 year olds, which was really old at the time, obviously. And uh, he's like, dude, we got to like give music one last shot. So I flew back in and wrote two songs with him, which ended up being the first two Sleeper songs. And uh, he invited Lucas so Luke started playing bass and we were just jamming. And then a week later, Ryan found Michael on MySpace. <laughs> He's like, dude, this guy's good looking. We should uh we should <laughs> we should try it out. That's a good way to pick. Yeah. Looking back on it, that was a very good choice yeah. and a very good asset for Mike to have on top of his uh, talent other talents. But yeah, yeah. So we invited him over to my house and then like, man, this sounds horrible, but we just got in the hot tub together, all four of us, and just talked about life and it ended up that he was like a big Lord of the Rings fan like me and we're both into archery and shit. so um archery yeah man my my uncle builds bows um <laughs> and it, he was like into long bows at the time I don't know we just you know we fell in love and became best friends whatever but that's how sleeper started from so I, so you found him on MySpace <laughs> just like Ryan was just searching I guess Did... I don't know what Ryan was doing I think he was just looking for hot dudes on my I don't know <laughs> <laughs> It just turns out one well, this guy could sing, but it didn't really matter. Micah can't sing, but yeah, he could definitely <laughs> scream. Well, um, uh, but was it was it was he trying? Like he was a it was something other than just his picture. Yeah, yeah like he, he was trying. He was to a, be in a band or had a different band or something. He was a bass player in a band with um, with Jason Castro, the uh, the guy who almost won American Idol. Uh, they were in a band called Charlemagne, I think, or Keeping Lions, one of the two. So me and Micah went to go see him play, and Micah ruined the show. He like tried to stage dive, but his cord was still tied to his amp, and his amp fell over and he broke his amp and the show had to stop and we we're like dude this guy's a, a nightmare uh <laughs> but we ended up hanging out more and we thought he was awesome so and he's a really good lyric writer he was he was in college to be a screenwriter and um his first you know his first lyrics was our first song to flagship All right, pardon the interruption, guys, but I got to tell you about something I think is really terrific, and that's movement watches. I have a movement watch. It fits my style perfectly. It's kind of black, minimalist. It's beautiful, and it's understated, but it also sticks out. It really completes my look when I try to maybe dress up or go out. I wear mine uh, if I put on a collared shirt or take my wife out, but it also looks good if I'm just wearing a T-shirt. But when I say looks good, I should say looks great. I get asked about the thing all the time. I got one for my wife. Uh, Reva that works on the show has one. These things are terrific, and we all get asked about them whenever we wear them out in public or anything like that. And here's what's great about it is this company was started by two broke college kids who wanted to wear stylish watches, but they couldn't afford them, so they started their own company. And so these guys totally get it to the degree where these things start at $95. If you would go to the department store, you'd find watches like this, and they would be, I'm telling you, four to $500. But Movement figured out by selling online, they're able to cut out the middleman and all that retail markup and provide the best possible price. It's classic design, quality construction, and it's styled you know, in minimalism, which I love and you will too. And here's the thing, over a million people have already bought these watches in 160 countries. And if that wasn't enough, 15% off just because you listen to this podcast. And of course, that's with free shipping and free returns. You can get 15% off your movement watch today by going to mvmt.com slash labeled. This watch really has a clean design that makes a great fashion statement. It makes a great gift. You can get a gift for somebody starting at $95 that will be massively impressive to them. Trust me, it makes a terrific gift. Now is the time to step up your watch game. Go to mvmt.com slash labeled. mvmt.com slash labeled. Join the movement.
Okay, so then y'all made a band out of that. So Lucas and you and Ryan. Yeah, was- and it, yeah. Ryan, Ryan Conley, uh, Lucas Starr, Micah, and me. Mm-hmm. James James came to the picture after we had already released an EP thing, but but when we when me and Ryan got together, it was never going to be like a Christian thing. It's just Micah showed up and we we're like, we need a front man, and he was a Christian. He and he just wanted to write about what he believed. So like his family's super Christian and whatever, and so yeah, that's that was his life, and he wrote about it. We got labeled as a Christian band, but really one of us was leading the charge there. So the only reason it was a Christian band at all was just because the front man happened to have that really strong conviction. Yeah, really. and I mean, we, we went along with it because we could play churches and whatever. I mean, and Ryan was a Christian. Everybody was Christian except for me at the time. But like, I'm like, well, shit, we can play churches and get paid, you know, 300 bucks. That's insane. Of course, I'm going to take it. Again, I'm a fraud. I'm a hack, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only so in took- this for money. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I'd have to say fundamentally, though, you know, you have some tension with, like you say, that you don't want to be mean to people that have faith, but you think it's all bull. But if the front man, who's a strong Christian, the name of the band is O Sleeper, which is a Bible reference, right. and the front man is writing entirely about that. So I mean, you had to know that you were walking straight into obviously a Christian band. Yeah, yeah. It? But the but it was. I mean, I love the music, obviously, and I didn't really care. You didn't you know? care. So if if the what, how did the band name come up? As far as how did you feel about the fact that even the band name was a Christian reference? It just it didn't bother you at all. Didn't bother me. I yeah. It, yeah, I didn't care. But and you weren't worried. You didn't feel any conflict. I know you're making that joke about being a fraud, which I don't think is the case. But <laughs> uh, but you didn't. It didn't bother you at all that uh, you didn't see any negatives coming down the road of being in a Christian band at that time. Not at the time. Um, I mean, we haven't signed to a Christian label or right. So but, that uh, didn't, at, even after that point, that didn't give you pause. Like because I mean, even Christian bands in that time would would go. Hang on a second. Are we sure we want to go this way and get labeled this way and marked as this? You know. So that was conversations even Christian bands had like us at the time before we signed. Well, it, it's it's like self damning to do that at the time. I thought you know because if you said you weren't, now you've nixed yourself from you know Tooth and Nail Records. You've nixed yourself from uh, you know all the churches that or all the Christian fests that you know pay a lot of money and get your name out there. Now you can't play Cornerstone, all that stuff. You know. So I feel like being a secular band would have you know that's self. Uh, emulating, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it again, once record two hit, we, me and Micah started talking about. That's when I started singing a lot more, uh-huh. and I started writing my own lyrics for stuff and whatever. And that's when the the dynamic between me and Micah, sort of arguing in our lyrics, came about, which I think is a beautiful thing. <laughs> Yeah, it started around record two. If you hear Mike in interviews, I mean, he's always like, "Yeah, you know, Shane's an atheist. He he writes his stuff, whatever." And we think that it's awesome. Or our, our, the da- dynamic of our band is is the argument, which is cool. Mm-hmm. So when I am God came out, I mean, even your first band, I mean, it's just really funny to think about <laughs> it in that regard. Because I mean, that the logo even for O Sleeper. So uh, the band name is a Bible reference. Even the logo, or what became the prominent logo, is the broken pentagram. Tell people about that. The Broken Pentagram came about uh, an idea from Ryan Clark of Demon Hunter. He did all our artwork. Um, he's done every artwork. He's even he did all the Woven War stuff too. Dude is so talented. Anyway, um, the second record when we got that symbol, um, that's two thousand nine. That's called Son of the Morning. So that's again, right. Another very Christian album. Uh, that that's when Micah started taking it. Like we got super fantastical about it. Uh, the concept. And it's literally just about the war between good and evil. And 
to me, I mean, I have I have that symbol tattooed to my chest right here. To me, it's it's just about victory over anything in your life. The the broken pentagram basically is is tearing the horns off of uh, the upside down the goat head. So yeah, um, I always thought that was just so cool because I mean, first of all, pentagram is tough and evil, like, and it has all the metal <laughs> symbolism and all the stuff that's like awesome. Like in a way, a pentagram is bad. But it's because it's right. <laughs> satanic. So it's like, the, from the Christian point of view, that's such a hit. And Ryan Clark nailed it. He's great at that, obviously. Yeah. Now he's reclaimed even the pentagram and showing, <laughs> reclaiming and having defeated Satan and moving on in power and still getting to have that badass look of a pentagram. So it's, right. it's like, yeah. it's pretty awesome. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, when people tell, like, you know, I, I have kids come up to me and say, yo, uh, so, you know, you're not a Christian. Why is that tattooed on your chest? I'm like, dude, it's like, first off, this, this is a decade of my life. But no, for me, it means like just victory over whatever you are trying to get through. Mm -hmm. So when No Sleeper's out during the first couple records and stuff like that, I would love to hear about how it felt and how things did get weird and what Christian stuff you've seen that is totally stupid or you having to pretend or be uncomfortable or called out. Was there times going in and from 2007 on where you were going with the grain and making sure people didn't know that you were an atheist. And b by the way, do you consider, you did and do consider yourself atheist? Is that your terminology? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, you can call it whatever you want. I just don't believe that you have to adhere to any book to, you know, have morality and, so, uh, but did you, how did that go as far as interacting with the festivals I was always and the honest churches? With kids. I mean, you, you've seen me on tour. I, mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not really quiet about it. I try to be respectful, you know, if a kid comes to me, he's like, how long have you been a Christian? Or, you know, what's this lyric about? Or whatever. I'll usually be like, oh, well, actually, I'm not. But if you have questions about it, go talk to Micah or whatever. If you, you know, if you want to learn about guitar pedals, talk to me, whatever. I try to be respectful to, to people when they ask that stuff, but I, I definitely haven't been quiet about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, my guess is it, it, even if you try to be respectful to them, when these people look up to you, when they find out you're not Christian, my hunch is they're not necessarily respectful to you. <laughs> no, no. They, I, I've had kids cry and leave the show. I've had... Uh, uh, slow so, down just tell just this is good <laughs> stuff so i mean here okay so we're, we played a church one day and this is how stupid people are um i had a a pedal board at the time i had the axe fx i just got it and one of my like i had this you know just crazy effect and labeled on my pedal board it was called holy shit, mm -hmm. just because it sounded like insane and a kid saw that then he went and told his parents and they threw a fit to micah after the show left crying and <laughs> the, said that they, they the could, not, family? could not support O Sleeper ever again. It's over. They, they lost fans because your piece of shit guitar player, just Satan advocate, had yeah. holy shit on his pedal board. F*** you. I don't want fans like that. F*** them. <laughs> well, well, I know, but I mean, that's what you walked into with signing to a Christian label. So you, I mean, you in some way you did want fans like that because, and that's why churches would pay you three hundred dollars when nobody else would. I mean, <laughs> That's that's the rub, right? Yeah, I guess so. But I didn't um, know at the time that that's that was the the insanity I was getting into. I think that's what the ultimate irony is, and I think you are respectful and being respectful when you talk about things and other people. And obviously, if you're able to be buddies of me and best friends of Micah and stuff like that, obviously you're able to respect other people that even believe things that you think are totally wrong. Sure. But the ironic thing being going the other way, I bet you you've just had hundreds of instances of people being not respectful to you oh yeah all the time i mean every show someone will come and try to get my testimony and i'm like dude i'm not really into that and then you always tell them straight up like yeah yeah just i don't know i guess i guess it is fair for, for kids to come up and be like and assume my faith but it, it is it just gets old god <laughs> How was the rest of the band, though, when you would cause trouble or, you know, lose fans and those kinds of things? Man, again, I just have the best friends in the world. They, I remember at one point um, I wrote something online or a post or something and, and I got attacked for whatever reason. I can't remember. But Mike had stepped in, wrote this like novel to this guy saying like he stands by whatever whatever i believe and he's you know just my boy and told this dude off and said like dude we don't want fans like you if you can't accept uh, our boy either you know in his in his side That's of great. yeah so l tell me about the the lyrics and the, the, like you said some tell me some of the specific songs and stuff where you wrote or you tell me about that whole thing with mike and you doing lyrics together or as an argument or what that vibe explain that whole vibe to people sure um uh, on some of the morning, there's a song called Reveries of Flight. Trust! 
All my lyrics on that are about uh, how, metaphorically, I'm just at this bottom of this mountain and there's a cliff and I just can't get up it, but everybody else has wings to be able to just get up there and see it from that perspective. And it's just about how I can't, I wasn't given wings to be able to just, you know, believe this idea, mm -hmm. but I want them so I can see from their perspective, you know? And so mm -hmm. I wrote that in the studio kind of randomly one day on a, like a down day and just worked in Pro Tools and got the first half of the song. And then Micah came in and he's like, I want to do a response to that, to your lyrics. And so in Reveries, it's basically just him um, responding to when he comes in at the, at the end of the song. He goes on a rant, basically just talking to me. And that was really special. And I mean, we were like crying in the studio. I don't know if you've ever, you know, <laughs> had an Me, emotional. Uh, <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> Sounds Matt beautiful. Cry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was just a really special moment. And that song resonated with a lot of people. And uh, the next record, Children of Fire, I just wrote a whole acoustic song. And that's the song Means to Believe. And it, again, just kind of reiterates where I. I just can't believe this stuff. And if, if I had the tools to, I would, mm -hmm. um, but I don't. Uh, and then later on in the record, he, uh, in the story of the record, it's too much to get into, but uh, he kind of responds to that in another song as a song. So what song is that? The Family Ruin. She finds him by the fire. His claws have got him dripping from he beckons her sweet daughter The voice that once avenged her younger life He's got the voice of a god The same one who got down in the name of his god Who took on the robe of a judge Without a life No, I think that's really, I don't know, I'll use the word beautiful, really, is the word I, that comes to mind there, that you care about it. It's not just cranking out songs or whatever. Like, you're interested in the discussion there in a genuine way. I know there's the surface level stuff that's annoying and stupid, but you're sure. actually interested in the discussion, and that song coming from a genuine place still demonstrates that vibe you have of, yes, I don't believe this stuff, but... There's some part of you that goes, it could be true. And if so, I'd like to see it. Yeah. So is that still what, the way you feel now? Dude, if, yeah, if I could, had any evidence in the world that, you know, there was an invisible monster out there pulling the strings, of course, but um, I just don't. And that, I mean, means to believe was my letter to God if, mm -hmm. if I could. So Micah, though, being your best friend and someone who's authentic and good to be around and totally believable and doesn't exhibit the, anything bad about Christianity, how do you reconcile just looking at him and not thinking he's an idiot for believing? I, I, I do think he's an idiot. Okay. He'll hear this. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I think, uh, no, he's he's the best. Um, but on that front, I'm like, you're an idiot. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. I mean, I, I think that I, I, like to, I like to hear that. I think that makes a lot of sense that you can yeah. say that. I mean, that's a testament to what it actually means to be close to or friends with somebody. Yeah. yeah. We're, I mean, he's like my brother. We hang out every day. But How do you feel now about the decision to willingly right. enter a Christian band as, a, as an atheist? I think it's I, I think it's a good thing. I mean, I think that we helped out a lot of people, and those lyrics changed a lot of people's lives for the better. You know, some people just aren't going to be good not believing that there's a God, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think. I mean, you know, if you get a guy that just has no inhibitions about any, you know, really stuff, and that's the one string holding him back, uh, that's good. And if a guy didn't commit suicide... You know, uh, because of our lyrics, fuck yeah. So when people in Christian bands talk about we did a lot of good, I think it mattered, we made a difference. They usually mean for the faith itself. But right. when you say when a, when an atheist or a secular musician says, "I think what we did mattered," um, I think the Christian 
question out there is mattered to who mattered why mattered for what uh again just i mean if 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 it changed the world for the better then that's a good thing but there's a lot of stuff that christianity does uh you know politically that i think is <laughs> horrible but with our fans and our reach some people needed need some people need religion to be sane so if it helped them in any way but i also get atheists all the time come up to us and say uh you know y- y'all's lyrics help me through some shitty stuff whatever i get that you know 30 percent of the time probably you know yeah. so you you get the best of both worlds then you get christian fans and atheists but you can get them both yeah it's you know there's almost a theme to your life where it seems like you've been just tied up into this whole christian scene and and willingly so and it's interesting from your point of view. And then even after all this and being on Tooth and Nail and a Christian label and a Christian band, you wind up taking over for Tim Lambesis <laughs> in Woven War, which is, you know, and I know the story's way more nuanced than this, but the short version of it is this Christian lead singer guy tried to hire somebody to kill his wife and goes to jail for it. So it's just, I know it's not exactly, that's not exactly the narrative, but uh, it's still, <laughs> you've tied up into a general Christian thing, or that, you know, it's just a moniker of Christian hypocrisy is kind of the way that that comes across. But tell me about that. Well, I guess in defense of the whole religious aspect of Lovinor, it's not at all because we, in our minds, we changed the name. Mm-hmm. You know, we re-signed a new contract with with Metal Blade. It wasn't we mm-hmm. weren't on the Asley Dying contract, and those guys had just f-ing lost their job because of a an asshole. You know, yeah. And um, I don't want to speak for them. They they all have their own sort of beliefs. But watching that guy promote Christianity and stuff, and just seeing the type of character he was, I'm sure had an impact on what their faith was going to be like later. Uh, really. It's horrible to me just jumping into another fucking religious mess, and that comes up every woman we're show too. That's right. That's what I. That's what I think's the yeah. interesting tie over here is this. Yeah, you jumping into another religious mess, right? Yeah. How does the religious part actually affect those guys and you in the situation? Uh, at first, it was a lot because I mean they had to, you know, like you said, when you start a band, you have to make that choice. Oh, are we going to you know play the Christian market, whatever? And I said absolutely not. I'm over it. But that was a gigantic part of Azalea Dying's fan base. You know? Absolutely. And they're like, well, shit, are we going to just alienate these people? I'm like, dude, we're not alienating anybody. We're just a fucking band. Uh, I'm going to write about, you know, Trump and <laughs> Glo- global warming and real shit like real problems <laughs> not i don't care about this this uh okay <laughs> so, okay, I mean, so it- okay i'm starting <laughs> starting to illuminate to me tell me if i'm making sense about this so as i lay dying was basically at, at some point a heavily christian band with a heavily christian fan base those fans are hard to shed. They'll stick around. They'll stick around yeah. forever. And so even to have a spinoff band after this, not As I Lay Dying, there's no way to avoid the, even the fact that at this point, is anybody in Woven War Christian? Uh, I would say probably not. Um, we don't talk about it much, but yeah. I don't I mean, so, so I don't think so. Essentially, no Christian anything in the band. Front man, band members, basically none. I'm sure they have their own stories of faith and what they believe, but sure. nothing really Christian at all, and certainly should not be considered a Christian band. But I bet you half of the Woven War fans are Christians, right? Maybe. I'd say probably a third for sure. Yeah, but... somewhere between a third and half, because they just carry, carried right through. So yeah. Um, and w- the weirdest thing, I guess, is the fact about Tim. Is it is it hypocrisy there, or like help me understand a little bit the faith journey there? So he wasn't being a Christian at all toward the end. He wasn't. He was claiming I non guess. Christianity, and now maybe he is saying he's Christian again. I guess. I mean, and th- th- this is one of the most disgusting things about this conversation is that you know he did what he did, and then he put out an interview with uh, Ryan Downey. He did that interview. And he's like, he's like, oh, well, I, I refound my faith. And then, so then you have all these Christians that are like, oh, you, uh, Nick and Jordan and Josh and Phil, they, they f- abandoned him at his, at his weakest. And they yeah. should have been, they should have been f- helping him out through his journey and his walk, whatever the fuck y'all call it. And I'm just sitting back like, you guys are monsters. This dude like ruined everyone's family. These, uh, these dudes have mortgages on their house and shit. And they just lost their job because this asshole. And then there, you have Christians defending him because at some point in prison, he's like, oh, I'm going to be a Christian again. It's like, right. fuck, fuck that. 
that I, I find that really disturbing too because the it's a well worn path for Christian restoration. Like you could do anything you want to. Like, and I'm yeah. not saying I'm not saying who's genuine, who's not. And that's not the point. The point is, sure. you get the benefit of the doubt with Christianity so much that it enables, and you don't know who's a monster and who's genuine. But you can never sure. parse the two out because if you have a horrendous fall and do horrible, horrible things, and then just simply wait a period of time and then say, <laughs> but now I see, and now I you know, say anything positive about God, immediately you have the full support of all Christians everywhere. And that's that can be, you know, from your point of view, that is actually harmful. To- that's disgusting. Forgiving someone because they rejoined your team is is not, there's no, I don't think that's genuine. I just don't, it's not genuine at all. It's like, oh, he's back on the team, uh, you know, rooting for the, the right imaginary monster. It's like, and and then condemning my guys, the, the rest of the woven work guys for abandonment and stuff. Uh-huh. It's like, who? What planet are you on? What the fuck? <laughs> so they don't have any time for him now. Like they feel like he has hurt them, and they don't forgive him. I mean, uh, you don't have to speak for them. I, you know, yeah, but. you'd have to ask them that. Um, all I know is, and I don't want to speak for them. So, but I I can attest to like the shit they had to go through because of what he did. What I mean, no one should have had to go through that. You know, yeah. and I mean, you know, Tim's wife or ex-wife should never have had to go through that. And now she's, you know, living in fear and stuff. When it, I, it, Well, I mean, yeah, just it's everybody's world was like turned upside down, dude. Like, every, like, yeah, like so, it's, everybody had mortgages on their house. They were they, they yeah. had toured 11 years. They had a career. And then that was just taken from them. You know, it's just it was bull. So it's not and, so it's too convenient just to say, oh, but I believe in God again. Oh, but I believe in God. So, do, you know, good for me. And, and I'm back in the I'm back at the. Yeah, the altar, which yeah. puts him in the position to be the main beneficiary going forward. Yeah, like he, like he will be like he has the potential to have everybody's favorite story of restoration and redemption and hero yeah. and have yeah. gone through the valley and has come back out on top. Yeah, what whereas a everybody hero. else is just off to the side, like with no no path anywhere, yeah. except to maybe look bad for not forgiving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's dangerous, man. It, I guess disgusting <laughs> is. Uh, I don't know. I'm this. I, that won't be my word for it, but I totally understand your your feeling that way. I'm I, I'm so removed from it that I don't have any real. Yeah, I'm, I don't have any particular thoughts about a particular individual, but your point of view makes a lot of sense to me. I'll say that. Yeah. Tell me about being in Woven War. It's fun. You like it. It was awesome, a, man. Is it a good fit now? I mean, do you have a good... Are y'all be able, gonna be able to make a good future out of it and a stable thing? I mean, I, it would be awesome, but it's just nobody buys music anymore. So, yeah. well, I've I mean, heard you to, say that a few times. So let's tie all these things together in. Like, and, and you're on you're on record with O Sleeper and other stuff and other interviews, and have already mentioned to me once a day how you never made any money. Tell me, <laughs> just let's just spend time on that topic. Woven more O Sleeper, Evelyn. These bands are successful. I mean, these bands sure. people love. These bands have hundreds of thousands of fans. Yeah, I mean that's uh, your re- that's your real point of view. You've never made any money. I mean, we've I've I've it's supported me thus far. Um, when we're talking about real money, like uh, getting married money and kid money and stuff like that, you do, for us anyway, for both bands, it's just not there financially. But um, you asked about my time in Woven War. It, it's been fucking awesome. The world has lost its mind. We got to go with, on tour with like we did seventy five yeah. days within flames in Europe. I mean that was one of the best times of my life. Yeah, yeah. Did my first bus tour, you know, um, with them, and the first tour was with Zach Wild, dude. Oh yeah, what? that is so so cool. Yeah, I love <laughs> Zach Wild. But so to put that into your first bus tour after your your whole career from two thousand and one to now was you just had your first bus tour. Oh uh, yeah, with one more we we had uh we shared it with While She Sleeps in Europe and it was it was pandemonium. And you had to share it. And it was in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> it was awesome, dude. It was the it was incredible. So with O Sleeper you would just bring home hundreds or a couple thousand bucks at the end of a tour or something like that at most. Something like that at most, yeah. yeah. Well, now that O Sleeper's a three piece, um we're able to like you don't have to split it five ways and um mm-hmm. that's great. It's it's you, been you, you you perform as a three piece. Uh huh. Oh, that's awesome! I didn't know you're performing as three piece. I bet that's yep. really fun. 
<laughs> and so you're singing a lot in Woven War too, right? Singing and screaming, right? It's almost all singing. Uh, the yeah. new record has quite a bit of screaming, but I just hate screaming, man. It hurts and yeah. it, it's yeah. <laughs> it's annoying to listen to to me. But, and uh, we, we may be a little out of order here, but I think your singing is great too. So you, you didn't thanks. even start as a singer. You were just guitar player and just found out you could sing or what? Yeah, the, uh, you know, Sleeper on our first EP, our bass player is like, we wrote this part and uh, he's like, dude, this has to have singing over it. They threw me in the booth and I just started crooning, and that was the first, first time. And since then, I've, I've really tried to develop my voice. Is, I, I feel like I'm singing better than ever right now. I, I feel like in regards to guitar, I've been playing for 28 years, and mm-hmm. I've, I've definitely just gotten worse. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Just because lack of practice? Like the, yeah. the amount of hours putting into the... And I don't like playing hard riffs live anymore. I don't like playing in these crazy leads live, because then you, ha- you there's an hour of practice before the show. You can't just get on whiskey and get up there and play riffs like it sucks yeah so at this point you've got a real nice balance of everything it sounds like so you're married yep. you have a house you have two bands you're active with O sleeper and woven war That's you right. love both of them yeah and you have a side job at home yeah it's great so so is that is that a sustainable kind of balance thing like it, it actually sounds great to me to, to be able to keep thing everything in its right category and have it running at an optimum thing without having to put all the pressure on one thing to yeah sustain your whole life and and with with Wolvermore guys I mean we we decided we're coming home with like 300 bucks and we're you know or a grand or whatever and being 35 just isn't okay when you're gone for two months so we've had a talk recently that we we're not going to take tours unless they're a great financially with the right bands whatever so we haven't mm-hmm. been touring you know we've been off tour since last october and uh same thing with a sleeper we're not going to tour unless we can but yeah i think this is the best time of my life i'm freaking married i got a house i got a dog and i got a job that i i'm the boss and uh, tell me about that job real quick and how it fits into your if you I, so, have tour, touring and recording and stuff. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just a home inspector. So whenever, you know, people buy their house, they want to get checked out. I, I, it's awesome because, you know, I make my own schedule. So whenever we leave, I just tell my mm-hmm. realtors, hey, dude, uh, I'll be gone. Here's another guy that I know that's awesome until I get back. That's great. So so it's a pretty good balance of all those things. And you, if you need to be off to go to the studio or whatever, you just don't take appointments. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Th- and it pays really well. Been it. <laughs> Yeah, that has been really. I think that's just a great way to do it. People like I'm seeing more and more musicians emerge with these alternative ideas. Some people just make licensing music where that they make money from, so they can do their creative projects for themselves. Mm-hmm. Some people take you know day jobs, or, and it's more and more people that are not taking regular jobs but coming up with something clever they can do. And there's something about that that preserves the art more. Like you don't have to make compromises. Yeah. with the art because it's not just a, your only way to pay your mortgage. Yeah, exactly. And I mean. I, I, I'm off by one every day and I'm like hungry to get in here to the studio and to start writing shit. So, oh, that sounds great. Yeah. That's, and so that's, that sounds great. I am really happy for you and to Thanks, have known bud. you through a bunch of this journey <laughs> and stuff anyway. And I, I know we don't get to talk all the time, but I've enjoyed catching up today, Shane. Yeah, man, it's awesome. Thanks for having me. Cool. All right, my name is Matt Carter. I do the show along with Toby Morell and Aaron Lunsford. This episode's also produced, edited, and mixed by Melanie Studley. Assistant producers Marshall Fremuth, Reva Hansen, and Tyson Paletti. Special thanks to Adam Scatula from Tooth & Nail for helping to develop the show. All right, see you soon. Bye.